Ambassador Kelly Craft, former U.S. permanent representative to the United Nations, welcome to Al Arabiya. Thank you, Talal, and what a better venue to be surrounded by the 193 flags of the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you. How do you view the latest developments in Tunisia? Uh, the Tunisian Diplomats Association came out in support of the measures taken by President Qais Saeed. Uh, that's in uh, accordance with Article 80 of the uh, Tunisian Constitution. Germany announced that it does not consider measures taken by him a coup. And the White House uh, says it has not considered Saeed's actions a coup till this moment. You worked closely with Tunisian diplomats here at the United Nations. What is your take on the latest events there? Well, you know, just this past January, we were celebrating their 10th year of celebrating Tunisians' democracy. And the United States has stood beside them and supported their democracies and their freedom and, and the way they have treated their women and the minorities. And we, you know, stand, in my take, we stand very firmly with President Saeed because during COVID, it has really caused a lot of, of uncertainty, both economic and from a security standpoint. And so I think in order to continue his anti-corruption measures, this is why he had to actually bring in, bring in the military and himself and create the same strength. And it's unfortunate that it has to be at this time with COVID, but, but he, in order to continue what, what he has promised the people, what he ran on. And we stand with him. And, you know, I worked very closely with the former, both of the ambassadors from Tunisia and the most the recent one that is no longer here, uh, Kai, his name was Kai also. We worked very, very strong together. And even though we did have disagreements on the Middle East peace plan, we still are a firm ally of Tunisia. And by the way, they just had a gold medal, which is congratulations to the Tunisian swimmer. That's exciting news for Tunisia. Iran is preparing for the inauguration of elected President uh, Ibrahim Raisi next week, but the citizens are taken increasingly to the streets to protest increased water shortages. Starting in Khazakhstan province, some fear that Raisi will quell the protests by any means necessary, and he has started already. How do you see the situation developing? On August the 5th, Raisi will take office, but if you notice that the Supreme Leader and Rouhani have both you know, acknowledged the protests, these peaceful protests, it is every right of every human. It is part of the UN Convention to have the right for water. And that is a basic human need. And to protest peacefully. Ab absolutely, and that's what they have been protesting peacefully, but the problem is, the way the Iranian regime responds to peaceful protests are arrest, sometimes bullets, sometimes a lot of brutality. So what we have to really is we have to call them out. And, and this is the southwest portion of Iran. And if you think about this, Talal, there are the majority of the five million people there are Arab and minorities. And this is the area where they have selected to not invest in their infrastructure, knowing that they, they, you know, they do have droughts every so many years, knowing this, and that instead of investing in the infrastructure so that they don't have a water supply shortage, they have chosen to invest in this rogue regime and invest around the world in all of their proxies and in other areas, you know, with, whether it's Yemen, Syria, Libya, wherever it may be, Venezuela, Cuba, that is wrong. Several people have reportedly been killed by Iranian security forces and police during these protests. Raisi is most known for his heavy-handed approach to political dissent uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, what do you think the U.S. administration and the world community uh, should do to help? You know, I can speak from the Trump administration, and Donald Trump would have had none of this. As he kept applying every tool in our toolbox, we would have strengthened the sanctions even harder on the people. You know, their currency has been devalued. We would have continued to affect their economy. You go, talking about the Vienna talks with JCPOA, how can we possibly have a conversation with a country knowing at this very moment that they are, the brutal, the brutality that they're causing the people in the southern west region of Iran? 
we have no leverage if we go into this JCPOA and we do not hold this regime accountable. The rest of the world is watching us. They're watching how we're holding them accountable because the countries around them will then also act appro appropriately. Michelle Bachelet, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, in a strong statement last Friday called on Iran to address their chronic uh, water crisis in Khuzestan, rather than using excessive force to uh, and widespread uh, streets uh, arrests to crush the protesters. Do you think it's enough to issue statements such as the one issued by the High Commissioner for Human Rights on Friday the 23rd, a statement rejected already by Iran so far. What can the United Nations, its organs, uh, do to stop uh, the human rights reported issues and abuses in Iran? I mean, Talal, has her, any, any statement ever made a change in the behavior of this Iranian regime? No. And I know she means well, and I think her statement is accurate. But we need to see action from the Iranian regime. We need to have the UN come together and demand that this regime treat its Iranian citizens appropriately. The Iranian oil and gas sector is also reeling from uh, growing uh, protests. Some Iranian oil workers are now in strike, a strike that has the potential to spread across the nation. Your family is heavily involved in the energy uh, industry sector. How does that affect the fulfillment of the new president's promise to his people of improving the economy, improving their living standards? Yes, he did. He was elected on that promise in order to, to really uphold the Iranian people, their economy, to, to make their life better. So I have not seen any change in behavior in this regime. And as you well know, being from an energy state of Kentucky, Energy is the backbone of your country. It, without energy, you can't have clean water. You wouldn't have electricity. You wouldn't be able to have school systems for the children. You wouldn't be able to have industry. So therefore, you wouldn't have profits. But you know, in Iran, the Iranian people never see the profits of their industry, whether it's the energy, the oil sector, any industry. The profits go straight to the Iranian re regime. With reference to Iran's support to militias in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen, Iranian President-elect Ibrahim Raisi said Iran wouldn't stop supporting Shiite militias group fighting across the Middle East or rain in its, uh, rain in, uh, its missile program and said rush regional and missiles issues are not negotiable. What does that mean for the future of the region? Well, if you think about the, the whole region, Iran, the Iranian regime, wherever you see conflict in that region, you can point back to that regime, whether it's through proxies or whether it's through the regime itself. I mean, we have to continue holding them accountable. We have to continue to stand up for the Iranian people and for the countries in the Middle East, especially the countries that have now you know, normalized with Israel. They're all watching to make certain and to see how the U.S. responds. We are the superpower. We must hold the Iranian regime accountable. It seems that the President Biden administration is a fast learner. Uh, they are now insisting on negotiating uh, on the Iran ballistic missiles and their influence in the region. Your comments, Madam Ambassador. You know, why are we going to give up our leverage? I think we have to see a change. We have to see, first of all, a behavior change. Second of all, we need to see a change in the fact that they need to allow the IAEA more access into Iran and to see the nuclear power production. We need to be able to see that they are going to stop their ballistic missile program because, you know, if you've got the ballistic missiles, then you are producing nuclear. You can put a nuclear warhead. So then they, therefore, they have the capability. That is the only leverage we have. And we cannot allow the, the Iranian regime to get by with continuing, as they did during JCPOA, with continuing to bypass disagreement. Iran has broken all the limits uh, it agrees to, uh, to under the JCPOA. Uh, it's now it reaches small amounts of uranium, up to 63 percent purity, its highest level ever. It also spends far more advanced centrifugals, uh, uh, and the IEA has not been able to access the surveillance camera since uh, February. How can the world ensure the peaceful nature 
of the Iranian uh, uh, nuclear program. Well, all I can say is that during the Trump administration, our sanctions were non-negotiable. If anything, we were actually adding to our sanctions, making them stronger, trying to bring down this economy within the IRGC to make certain that they were not capable of arming the Houthis or of propping up Assad or of Maduro in Cuba. Look at what's happened in Cuba. So we also need to remember we've got to call out Russia and China for helping the Iranians to be able to have more arms, to be able to have weapons, to be able to have access. And if you look at what China is doing with Iran, they've signed this deal. Do you think the Iranian people have seen anything about this contract with China? My fear is China is going to be giving Iran the same tactics they used in Hong Kong, and that is their surveillance tactics. We hear about moves inside the Congress to introduce a bill to keep the arms embargo and sanctions on Iran. You are well connected to the leadership of the Congress. Can you tell us more? We just have a, a, a House bill in Congress that's been sponsored, that's just been presented by Congressman Bacon and Congressman Wilson, that is very similar to snapback, which Secretary Pompeo and myself initiated in the Security Council. And so they, too, see the importance of continuing to prevent Iran from nuclear capability and from transferring of arms. What do you think of the attempted kidnapping by Iranian agents of American journalists and activist Masih Ali Najad, who hails from Iranian roots on American soil? Well, it just shows you that the behavior of this regime has not changed, and then more importantly, that they feel threatened or they would not be coming on American soil using deadly tactics to try to kidnap this Iranian author, someone who has spoken freedom, spoken about democracy, spoken about the brutality against her own people, the Iranian citizens. And we, we must demand a behavior change. And we have not seen any behavior change. If you look at 2015 when they received the billions for, you know, JCPOA, what did they do with that? Did we see any improvement on the economy or the, the lives of the Iranian people? No. But we did see improvement within the Revolutionary Guard Corps and all of their proxies. Ambassador Kelly Craft, former United States Ambassador to the United Nations, we thank you for this exclusive interview and we thank you for your valuable insights. Thank you, Talal. Thank you for having me on this very windy day right in front of the most of the United Nations building. Thank you.